The following podcast contains adult content, spoilers, and truth. A whole lot of truth. Enjoy. Alright, I gotta go check my hair. These stainless locks don't fix themselves. Mm -hmm. I guess I better take my shirt off. (laughs) No, thank you. Purpose isn't uh, isn't to shoot for shock, but you're never you never have been one to shoot for shock anyway. You have just been one to speak your mind, and truly really all this is about. Um, and I know for the most part, you're probably going to garner a lot of views just out of curiosity. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, obviously, I don't edit anything. Feel free to say whatever you want to about me or anybody else. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Safe House, episode five. I am your host, the best professional wrestler you have never heard of, professional wrestler extraordinaire, Kirby Mack. And no, this is not an illusion. You do not need to adjust your iPads, iPhones, or computer screens. Sitting next to me in the Safe House Episode 5 is perhaps one of the most controversial uh, figures in the professional wrestling, I would say Southeast, but you might as well say industry. Um, they call him the Jim Cornette of the South. Um, Jim Cornette is I think he's a little bit better. Well, but he's all up, up in Connecticut. Actually, Cornette, I remember, he told me the, uh, he told me the Jim Barnett. Yeah. The modern day Jim Barnett. Yeah. Well, he's yeah. the J.J. Dillon of the safe house because he's the fifth guest. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I, uh, it's an honor actually and a privilege to have Thomas Simpson sitting. Friggin' miracle. In the safe house. Yeah, it is. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, it was, uh, I was listening to Ricky Regal's radio show um, when you guys were discussing the safe house mm-hmm. and you called in and you were a lot uh, tamer than I expected you to be, mm-hmm. but you did uh, you know, say, oh, I will, I, will, um, I will indulge in lady parts before I ever talk to Kirby Mack again. And it wasn't a week later I was calling Ricky Regal and saying, hey, Thomas, how do those lady parts taste? Because we were, <laughs> we were able to, to forge, yeah, we were able to forge some kind of... Uh, relationship uh, mm-hmm. back together. Mm-hmm. But um, that, like I told you before, uh, we're not going to go too deep into our relationship, into what happened, into our falling out. We'll probably touch on it a little, we'll dance around some, but uh, really um, I'm bringing you in this part of the safe house to um, those who have possibly been hiding under a rock and don't know who Thomas is or don't know what Thomas is about will uh, be able to learn that. And then those that do know what Thomas is about, maybe you'll get a better understanding of why when you see him in the locker room, your stomach falls out because you realize, if my match is no good, I may hear about it. Maybe this will give you a better understanding on, on why that is. Uh, so, without further ado, let's dive right into this. Let's start uh, with the safe house, the top of the hour, like we always do. And Thomas, just kind of explain like what drew you to professional wrestling. You know, I, the first time I ever saw it I was live. Uh, I guess it was June of 1978 at a Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling Show at the Civic Center in Greenwood, South Carolina. I never even, my parents didn't watch it. I never saw it on television. But my Sunday school teacher, he uh, was a big fan. He wanted to take the Sunday school class mm-hmm. to, the, to the wrestling show. And I saw it and I just, I fell in love with it. Now, it was an amazing thing. Was this a church activity or was this outside of the church that your Sunday school teacher? No, he, he so planned it, like it all at like the church. Group it was a, yeah, it was a, our Sunday school class. We now, went to the church. Okay. We went to wrestling. Does that almost speak volumes on how different wrestling is perceived in pop culture nowadays or in society? Because I don't think really today, I, I think a lot of parents, parents might frown upon their youth group going to, say, Raw or SmackDown. Well, yeah, it was a family, I mean, it was a very family kind of oriented thing. I mean, sure. it was on, plus, it was more part of the culture. I mean, on Saturday afternoon at 1 o'clock, you watched on Channel 4. You watched Middle Atlantic. After that, you watched Middle Atlantic Championship Wrestling. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, there were more people who, there were a lot more people who watched it, like kids my age, which I guess I was maybe nine, that, did, that didn't watch it. Right. I mean, the, the 
the people that were that were not wrestling fans, they very small group. So even the people that didn't watch it at least knew the bad people like Ric Flair and Wally McDaniel and Ricky Steamboat and Paul Jones. I mean, they were known in the local culture. I mean, we didn't have sports teams. You only had what ABC, NBC, CBS. I mean, the field guy. Yeah, oh, yeah, I am. Uh, PBS. We got Channel Seventeen from Atlanta. So, but. Uh, Everybody, there wasn't a lot, a whole lot to do in, in rural South Carolina. Sure. So, you, so your youth group throws this thing together to go see some wrestling. Yeah, we go to see wrestling, and I fell in love with it. I watch it on TV. Want to go see it all the time. Uh, Want to go to the shows again in Greenwood. Went to Anderson. The so stage went to Augusta, Georgia. You've left your mark on the wrestling world um, as a promoter and as uh, I, I can't think of the way that you put it, but talent uh, a talent developer, yeah, which is a very yeah. appropriate term. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've actually, like some people say, hey, you know, I'm a promoter, I'm a talent developer, and they've got nothing to back it up. You've actually left the mark, and, and there's, there's proof in, in the, the whole uh, foundation that you've laid behind you. Um, but when you fell in love with wrestling and you started seeing wrestling, obviously as a kid, you're not like, oh, I want to run shows and develop talent when I get older. So I want to be a wrestler. Want to be I want to be a wrestler. Okay. Absolutely. I want to be Ricky Steamboat. Yeah? I did. I want to be Ricky. <laughs> I, want, I we had a trampoline at home, and I wanted to... Poor Evie. I mean, she, she got beat up. Her cousins got beat up. Whoever came on the trampoline, they got beat sure. up on there. So, I mean, yeah, I want to be a wrestler. Everybody wants to be a Was wrestler. there any formal training at any point in your, in your life to attend to <laughs> Other than just like being like you know Matt and Jeff Hardy's uh, uh, crash test dummy, because I know at some point they no, did. no, they never did. No, 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 they, they, no. I just uh, no, not really. I mean, you. I, so your ability to just tap out some untrained jobber on YouTube just comes naturally. <laughs> when you watch things, I, 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 I've got I, you know I like to think of myself as being an intelligent person, and you sure. kind of learn things, and you kind of hear people talk about things and you see things and you wrestle people like for fun but then it's kind of well if you're not planning it you kind of are shooting and so you learn things sure. and you kind of develop things and I mean it's just an osmosis basically. Okay. and so so little Thomas Simpson has developed a, a love for, for professional wrestling mm -hmm. and uh, he wants to become a professional wrestler at what point do you start to get involved with it Past just going to any the shows. first time, uh, well, back then we didn't have any okay. shows, okay. Uh, not per se like in South Carolina, I think there were some, I just didn't. All I knew was Crockett, okay, the Mid Atlantic or, or WWF or Tech or World Class stuff like that. But when I was in Atlanta, I lived uh, three summers, summer 86, 87, 88. I lived with my aunt in Atlanta, uh, and Fran. No, Aunt Sis. Oh, okay. Aunt Sis. You've been to Aunt Sis. Sure. Yeah, so, oh, when she lived over in Atlanta. So I lived with, so I lived there and I worked in Atlanta doing something. Well, she knew I was a big wrestling fan. I'd go to the shows there when they'd have it at the Omni and stuff. And really when I was there in 86 and 87, there was no indie promotion okay. in Atlanta. But there was Joe Petticino's Superstars of Wrestling on Channel 36. It was... Like, they had Memphis Wrestling, and I think they did some Stampede. They had a little Japanese stuff, the Crush Girls. Uh, they had other things. Keep going. I want to get a notepad. I, I, with, I'm, uh, I'm firing on all cylinders right now, and I don't want to forget With people, we, they had, uh, I think they had Continental Wrestling on from Alabama. So, they put, so, Joe's... Uh, Sponsor, the big sponsor was JR Clothing in Riverdale. And as you know, my aunt sis was an accountant. That was one of her clients. And she, she handled New Paul Heyman at one point. Now that's that's, that's so later. Okay, that's later. later. That's later. That's sure. later. Uh, but uh, the so she was we went down to JR Clothing in Riverdale and I to, I wanted some, to get some clothes and I'd seen it look seen it on the, the uh, TV and she said, Well we were down there, we're talking to guy and she said, oh, yeah, Thomas loves your restaurant. She was like, well, you want to be involved in it? So I'm like, yeah. Oh, okay. So, and he said, well, you know, they, they got this new Southern Championship Wrestling, the, I think it's actually the original SCW. Mm -hmm. And he, they, he said, well, Joe Pettersino runs a guy named Don McKinney. He said, Don's 
Don and his wife run Nani's Kitchen out to be the Flea Market. Come out there and meet up. I want you to meet them and everything. Tell them I sent you. And that was really my first exposure to wrestling business. So, so in what was, sense did you get involved with it? With the, I went and picked up people at the airport. Okay. Like Bruiser Brody and sure. Chris Adams. So the, actually my first bump, I tell, is... And then it comes full circle because you pick up Jake the Snake at one point. <laughs> yeah, <geez. laughs> yeah, but that would not take... My, the, the Bruiser Brody and Chris Adams did not take well, years off years off life. everyone's yeah. life from it. So it, the, he... So I told Bruce Brody they said the ring. I said, well, you know, I was wondering. He said, you want to be a wrestler? Yeah. He said, well, watch this. Grab me and slam me. And this was a few weeks before he got In the ring. killed. Yeah. Okay. He was a few weeks he got before he got murdered in Puerto yeah. Rico. So that was actually my first wrestling bump was a, a body slam from Bruce Brody. Okay. And so then I knew at that point it's probably not the wrestling for not me. Not for you. No, so no, 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 so no. You, you knew whether it was a pain tolerance thing or maybe like an athletic thing. Maybe no, I wasn't very athletic. Okay. Ever. Maybe the. Uh, the uh, yeah. The athleticism, the uh, physical side of wrestling wasn't for you, but obviously you definitely knew you had the mind for it. I thought, I thought so. I thought I knew what was. I mean, you, anything that you have a great passion for, even. But then I didn't think of myself even getting into promoting then. I, to me, this was the wrestling thing. Was just something I got to do over a summer. And it was fun. Sure. And it was nice, and it was kind of nice to be a little gopher and stuff. And I'd sit at ringside because I could really get the crowd going uh, even then. Kind of as like a plant. Yeah, and, and so doing that. And, and you and still do that nowadays. Occasionally. But occasionally you're a little bit too bigger profile. That you <laughs> yeah, and, and <laughs> it's too obvious. That was, it, is, it is way too obvious. Uh, but I could, I, I used to get, you know, the, get some good heat and sometimes, I mean, I. I remember, oh, it was I, that summer. Tommy Rich was wrestling there, and uh, the, it was his birthday. So, the, so one of the fans, this lady named Faye, a super fan of Tommy Rich, had bought up a cake, brought him a birthday cake and stuff. And so I was trying to mess around with them. I was trying like cheering for the heels and stuff. But yeah. Like the Mod Squad, Mac and Jim Jeffers from mm -hmm. Anderson, they were there, so I knew they were from Anderson and everything. So it was kind of. So I was I was against Tommy Rich and he had like Davy and Johnny Rich and stuff there and he so they they, they would give me hell and uh, and she brought me over a piece of birthday cake and I ended up going to a Continental show riding over there with her at uh, in uh, Birmingham okay. at the Batwell Auditorium uh, when Eddie Gilbert was booking there so uh, that same summer so it was uh, but I, you know to me it was just something I did for the summer I went back to college and. That was it right, until so, 92. So at this point, you get a, you got you start to get involved with wrestling, and you realize uh, it's not for me as far as the physical side of being yeah. a professional wrestler. Right. So I'm just going to have fun with it, uh, kind of as like a hobby. A thing. summer. Right. Yeah. So then that disappears. I guess you take a break from wrestling? Yeah, I, I went to college. I went back to college with my junior year, and then I went to Australia that second semester of my junior year, and I went to college and grad school. And I mean, I have two years of grad school. Okay. And then I finished... Grad school, and I didn't have a job. Uh, this was '92 when I finished up. It's kind of the economy was uh, was not the best then. It was right before Clinton took office, mm -hmm. and so I I worked. There was a job opening at a private school, Long Cat Academy in McCormick, South Carolina, and I went to work there and teaching math, high school math. I taught like five different classes. A, a day, so I mean, it was, and it didn't. I think I paid, got paid like twelve thousand uh, dollars for the year, and I mean, it was a thirty mile drive from Abbeville. I was living with my parents, and they got a thing in the mail uh, from the wide, wild world of wrestling. Wild, wild uh, world. Of wrestling. Wild, wild, wide, wild, wild world of wrestling. A wild, wide world of wrestling. A little difficult to say. It. It's very difficult. Yeah. So they uh, talked about promoting wrestling shows. Well. Everybody knew that I was a big wrestling fan there at the school. So they said, wouldn't you like to put on a wrestling show? So, uh, and this was, I guess we got a thing in maybe November of 92. So I said, sure. I said, well, I can promote it in Abbeville. There's a Civic Center there. It's, you know, it seats 500, you know, 600 people. I said, it's nice. Because the, the school didn't really have the facilities for it there. Uh, and it, the long case, a white flight school that was basically formed out of integration when they, they okay. integrated the schools uh, in McCormick, you know, most of the whites sent their kids to, to Long mm -hmm. And so 
But I, so we put on this show, and Abby, so, I, so they contacted me, and they sent a guy by the name of Chaz Rocco. Mm -hmm. Familiar they, with Chaz? Huh? I'm familiar with Chaz. You're familiar with Chaz. And so, uh, the late Chaz Rocco, now, unfortunately. And so they sent him to come and sell sponsorships, because the way the it worked was the school kept 25%. Of the gate after the first two thousand dollars. Okay. The promotion kept the first two thousand dollars and seventy five percent. Yeah. Basically, the idea was for you to you made money off the concessions. Okay. okay. That's when you really got the money. So I I agreed to do it. We put it together. So these folks, the Booker was actually Greg Price. Okay. That was my first invite. That was that the Greg Price, the the latest fest, Greg Price. So that was my first encounter with Greg Price, right. and uh, which the main event was supposed to be Wally McDaniel versus Greg Valentine. That did come off. One of the other feature matches was supposed to be Rob Van Dam versus Sabu, and Rob was just a I mean just had only been wrestling a year or two at that point. Uh, Junkyard Dog was on the show. Wow, man. Uh, the German stormtroopers, one of whom was uh, Chuck Coates. Mm -hmm. uh, Chief J. Eagle was yeah. in the main. He, he was Junkyard Dog's partner. Okay. And what, really, what always kind of blew my mind about about you is like even, um, let's say when you would do like managing spots here and there, like you may forget a spot here and there or or mess up or, or like you said recently, like last Friday right. night. <laughs> And that's just remembering like small little spots in the wrestling. But what always blew my mind about you is you had this incredible gift or talent to remember these matches and these things that happened. Like you know more about my career than I even know about it. And it's like you remember that match, and I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, and, and even things that back from my childhood. I mean, my, I'll talk to my parents and stuff about and family, and it'll, we'll be at like a family gathering and stuff, and mm -hmm. my cousin will say something. I was like, oh, well, what about when this and this? And they're like, I remember that. I, I don't know, I guess it's the way my brain works. Yeah. And, and wrestling-wise, I mean, as I've gotten older, I mean, I remember some angles and stuff, like from back when I was a kid and things, just like it was yesterday. But I mean, right. when you run, it's like I I was talking, uh, I, I guess I might as well name drop. Kevin Steen and I were talking last week. And I name said, drop know, on the safe house? I know. No. And especially me. So, hey, so Matt, Kevin, I was taking Kevin uh, back to his hotel last Friday night, which I said, you know, Kevin, I have promoted thousands of matches on hundreds of shows over the years. And I can remember some obscure things from years and years ago. Because we were talking about things, but, but you know, I can't remember the damn spot yeah. in my own match that I'm managing. You know, the one with him and Matt was just easy to pop. Yeah, he, and maybe, he did hit me, I fall off the anchor. If you want to get a little deep here, maybe that's why it might be so hard for you to forgive people for their past dis indiscretions because you can remember a lot of like. Oh, I'm a big bastard. No, that's just beyond that. I mean, I'm like, a uh, big But like some things, some things that people will just overlook and say, ah, whatever. You know, you remember. I come from vengeful. I, I come from, I mean, <laughs> my mom is like, you hold a grudge forever. You just like your aunt Louise. Yeah. Your aunt Louise held a grudge forever. She's like, yeah, you just it's it's in so, your DNA. So you uh, you jumped into wrestling. You were the Josh Matthews of this little fed SCW and whatnot. You, you you ran around. You know, you were a little. Oh yeah, 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 uh, yeah. You went to college. You helped promote some. Where did we, where did we go? From so there? I did the so we did the show there for Long King, and I met Chaz. Well, Chaz actually got fired. And so they sent, which he was good at selling sponsorships. So they sent Rob Van Dam to finish selling sponsorships. Rob Van Dam was not so good at selling he sponsorships. He smoked his sponsorship? He, was, he didn't do that back then. No. No, he didn't do that back then. So, uh, but we had the show, I mean, it drew like 500 people. It did very well. But I met a guy named Mitch Gowd with who was the referee and he owned the ring. Mm -hmm. He had ran ACW, which was Atlantic Coast Wrestling. Mm -hmm. He had bought it from Nelson Royal and the ring, so which they ran kind of the Carolinas. And so we met, he was fixing to start up his own promotion, uh, AC Bay, but American Championship Wrestling, him and Chaz, and actually the guys who fronted the money for the uh, Wide Wild World of Wrestling. They, one of them was breaking off from that group and, 
and uh, and get into business together. So when they started up ACW, yeah, I went to work for them. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to buy into it, but I mean, I wasn't you know, wasn't making much money. Sure. And I, they wanted like three thousand, four thousand dollars up front to buy in. You know. So I ran a couple more shows in Abbeville with them. I worked with some other folks. Uh, who I can't remember the guy's name. Oh, Brian Stevens. They were running some shows in Abbeville, and I, I helped them out one time. Uh, and they, I mean, he was a nice enough guy, but they just, you know, just because you like wrestling does not mean you should either be a wrestler or a wrestling promoter right. by any stretch of the right. The only person I, that I, that I still keep in contact from that the, that time with, uh, with Brian, the, with that outfit that was an Abbey, I can't remember what that was called, but uh, this guy, Casey James, Don E, he wrestles as Yeah. Man. Okay, yeah, I, I still keep in touch with him. Uh, but I but I, I don't even know what most of happened to those most of those guys. But working for ACW was fun. Uh, Tommy Good, who you remember from mm -hmm. Law, he he wrestled for him. Uh, Jimmy Garvin. That's the first time I ever rode on a Harley was with Jimmy Garvin. Okay, uh, he was uh, just a, a, cool a doll. Yeah, it is. Uh, him and, and his wife Patty Precious, uh, just wonderful people. Uh, the. Uh, and then I mean we then I guess that was they ACW shut down in like ninety three early ninety three and I I remember the last show I put on in Abbeville before the Omega era was I had uh, Jungle Jim Steele from WCW and Diamond Dallas Page and I, Diamond this is before Diamond I mean he was on TV and stuff mm -hmm. and everything but it was like before now, Bischoff came along at this point helping with ACW and running the shows in Abbeville have you. Met and, and started a relationship with Matt and Jeff yet? No. Okay. They weren't even in the business okay. by then, at that time. Maybe they were just getting started. Maybe they were just doing their little oh, stuff forget. in North Carolina. Wrestling Federation. They I know, I know, but they, uh, <laughs> but I mean, so I was, so I mean, Diamond Dallas Page, so I had, you know, these were guys that you, you could see on WCW that Saturday. They were on TV that, uh, that day, but WCW at the time, their business was in the toilet. It was right after the Bill Watts. Mm -hmm. Era and so they uh, so I'll never forget Diamond Dallas Page. I was sitting at ringside doing my shtick because people wanted to see me do that, sure. And I was raising hell and everything. I stood up and Diamond Dallas Page, you know, he'd spit out his gum and hit it, and he hit it and it popped me right in the mouth. <laughs> and it shot. was a, it was a, a, a fantastic shot. And but yeah, all those guys were so nice to work with, and and then actually, but thinking back to the ACW days. Ricky Nelson that runs the Mid-Atlantic uh, Championship Wrestling yeah. guy. Uh, he he used to work. He worked for ACW and I really liked him and the guy Colt Steele. They were really excellent uh, wrestling. Actually, Ricky and I still have a relationship uh, uh, promoter to promoter even yeah. today. So yeah. I mean, we, we, we still keep in contact and he calls me occasionally. So that company uh, shuts down. You promote your last show in Abbeville. Mm -hmm. Then what? Two years later so do you do anything in these two years on? I, 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 like I said with the Brian Stevens guy, mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I, I did like a managing, that was actually my first managing key. Okay. I managed this guy, I can't remember what his name was. And I managed there in Abbeville and I actually called myself the professor and I wore my high school cap and gown. <laughs> uh, and I didn't, I, I guess I was probably terrible. The next, so I got a call from Mitch uh, Gowd in I guess March of ninety, late March of ninety five. Said we're gonna start up ACW again, and we're gonna have a show on this. Put day. the band back together. Well, and, but then he said, <laughs> and he said, Do you want to, Can you make it? I said, No. I said, I've got. Uh, I was actually going to England on spring break during for, for, for vacation, and I said, So no, I'm gonna be out of the country. So he said, Okay, well, I'll let you know how it goes. And that summer. They wanted to do another show, and they were looking for investors. He said it's five hundred dollars to buy in. That'll. Hey, he he still had the ring and everything. He said we're going five hundred dollars. So okay, so I bought. It. I think we had the Barbarian on the show, mm -hmm. and uh, the main event was Barbarian versus Mike Justice, who was out of uh, South Boston, Virginia. He was really uh, kind of a Ric Flair style wrestler. He was really good. Mm -hmm. uh, so I managed him, and that was my second manager gimmick. So I decided well, I'm going to play an Australian using the accent. I had a cricket bat and I had a and a Kubra like fedora type thing. Right. 
So I, I'm here. I am manager against the Barbarian, who's I mean, he just come off TV. He was we actually had him on the the poster as head shrinker Sione because sure. he had just he was he had just I mean like a couple of weeks earlier been on with uh, teaming with uh, Rikishi yeah with it Samu with no Fat Fatu right. who was the uh, head shrinker and so we uh. So I'm here. I'm to the barbarian. It's like, oh God, I'm scared. Bar's like, you're not gonna use a cricket bat. I'm like, no, 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 no. He's like, where'd you get that? And I said, well, you know, England. I told him about my trip and everything. So we start talking about cricket. I played some in Australia, and uh, so well, I'm on my way to the ring. I'm excited. I'm like, you know, just, just sure. Oh, I've never. You know, it's like I'm managing against the barbarian, and my just so cool. So I'm walking out first, and there's a set of bleachers. And I can see Mitch and his then wife Patsy sitting like at the little commentary table in the, where they were at and had the band and stuff. I was walking and there was a rolled up wrestling, high school wrestling mat there. So I decide I'm going to jump over the so high school mat. Lessons, of course. Well, I fell. I hit my, my foot head <laughs> floop and I pancaked. And that was the that was the birth of high spots. Mitch, <laughs> Mitch and Patsy, they fall out of their chairs laughing so hard. Mike just is just uh, of course none of the crowd can see me. Yeah, because we figured that we could have made a hundred thousand dollars off of America's Funniest Home Videos. If they said I've still got some pictures at home of me from that night. Yeah, but it doesn't show like because I had on a pair of khakis and I mean it's like I'm scraped up here and here and here. And I mean it's just. It was awful, and I, I heard for days sure. after. But that was my big introduction, yeah, my, my big yeah. uh, deal as a manager. And I didn't manage for years after that. <laughs> that was that, but I, I don't think I managed. I started yeah. managing again until we started going over to. Uh, no, I, but I managed three count of AP. Okay, Olivia, which was so the your so the band is back together. We're running ACW, mm -hmm. and so when did, when did the boys come into the? Well, band? then that was. I guess August of 95, and we decided not to run any shows again. And then so Mitch calls me like in March of 96 and says, we want to do ACW. All of us that are investors want to Again do now, the third time. Yeah, the third time. So third time's we want to do it again, and, but this time we want to do TV. You know, it says, I know a guy out of... A, a and why not, right? Of Myrtle Beach. He's got TV. Well, see, Chaz, his mother was an executive for Channel 13 in Florence, South Carolina, which was also, they had like a station also up in Fayetteville. So this was covering the entire yeah. eastern And part. now apparently there's some promotion that uh, you got me booked for when I first started, somewhere down in that Myrtle Beach area, as Crazy K, that's still running TV. And I'll get calls from my family and they'll be like, I watched you on TV last night at Myrtle Beach. Is that Ben Throckmorton? I, I don't know. It? I don't know anything. It's Crazy K. And I was like, all I could think of is like the one with like Perry James and the Terminators. And that was Ben Throckmorton. It's got to be there. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway. Okay, so. <laughs> but no, so we, uh, so we, we started the TV. I mean, it was like $500 an hour for the TV production. It was not nice special. You seen the tapes. So mm -hmm. It was pretty good. It's, so we did our first TV taping, I think it was like maybe March 31st of 1996. And that is the night I met Matt and Jeff Hardy. And Matt and Jeff were there. Jason Arm was there. Joey Abs. Joey Abs. Shannon and Marty came. They were booked somewhere else that night. They came to the next day we did in Georgetown, okay. South Carolina. So that's the night I met. And I, they blew me away. I'd seen... Matt and Jeff and Jason do jobs on, on WWE. So you were aware of them? I, I was aware of them. I, I liked their work on there, and they what they did would just blow me away. If it was me in charge of the booking, we wouldn't have had the Jay Eagle and yeah. uh, the Jay Eagle <laughs> show the and, and stuff. And so, uh, but we would have we'd have had like, and the boys eventually got pushed. They now, got pushed. With some people, it's an it's an instant connection when you meet, and with other people, it's an instant uh, rub of friction. Like when we first met, and we'll we'll touch on that in a little <laughs> bit. Now, when you met Matt and Jeff, was there an instant friendship, or was it still just a working relationship? Uh, it was a working relationship, but then the the next the next show when we were all together, they asked about money, and of course, Mitch didn't pay money, mm -hmm. didn't pay for TV, and I paid them out of my pocket. 
that started the friendship. Because you were just that impressed with I was that I, I I valued us having them around as talent that much. Sure. Well that's good. A lot of so I things. paid so I made sure they got I mean it wasn't a lot. I mean we're spending so much money on T V, not getting anything back out from it. So it wasn't a lot, but comparatively speaking, it was it was good. I mean, right. it, for something between twenty dollars, it was something. Now. Period. And it was something now, and, and, and yeah, exactly. And so, and they knew they that, started, that, that their talents were appreciated. Yeah, they knew that their talents were appreciated, and we. I was kind of. And it's not place. like anybody can look back and say, "Dang, Thomas, these kids just worked you out of money because <laughs> Vince McMahon made millions off of those guys." Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean it's. So that's that was the start of the friendship, and I I, came, I got kind of in their little clique at ACW, and of course that ended up causing problems. And a year later, almost well, I mean it was about a, maybe eleven months later, we had the big breakup, and I left ACW. Now, is that anything you want to touch on real quick? The breakup, or does it matter? I mean, it was basically like okay, you had Jay Eagle and. Mitch's ear and, and Chaz's ear, and they want to do their one thing. I want to push more of the younger guys, high flying you style. Well. I want to do, yeah, I want to do stuff like, I mean, I like Japanese wrestling, sure. Mexican wrestling. That's what I want to do. That's what those guys did. Matt had stopped running the New Frontier shows. He had stopped, they didn't have the money. And his investors, his business partner, had screwed him over on things. And so he just was tired of it, didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. So I was tired of it. He said, and I knew they were coming. They were doing some work for uh, Chance Williams and Rick Michaels, uh, NCW, which evolved into Wild Side and Anarchy mm-hmm. later. And he told me. So he, they said. Uh, so I said, we well, come by my parents' house uh, on the way home, and uh, let's have some dinner and and let's talk. Because I said I'm tired of ACW, and 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 man, they said well, we're not coming back. Uh, Although, weirdly enough, the match they wrestled was against Lodi and Toad for the uh, Dangerous Minds. So it's like Lodi is like, that was like maybe his fourth match or mm-hmm. something. So I mean, Lodi's got trainees and stuff now. We're talking there. It's like, oh, Brad. I said, yeah, Brad's like his fourth match, you know, working for me back, back when he was. So, there, no, at this point, though, it, with in Matt and Jeff's career, they're already doing some jobs. They're doing jobs. So it's not a big thing for them to say, we're not coming back. They're no, just, they no. were at the point where they're like, look, we're kind of we're established. People know us. We can kind of... Yeah, but, but, but they weren't getting any kind of good booking. No, okay. Plus, like anybody else, I mean, they were getting booked around here and stuff. But, I mean, it's like 20 bucks, 30 bucks. And they were going and doing, you know, work, working for Vince every so often. Now, why do you think that was that they weren't getting almost what they deserved? Do you think... No one was other than, like, names. Okay. That, I mean, the, the name folks were getting the bulk of the money. Okay. And plus, I don't think, uh, indie-wise, I, no one's really drawing. See, so anyway. so it's almost like after Matt and Jeff got signed and blew up and the whole attitude era changed, then that's when the indie game decided, well, we'll just make our own stars. There was a lot more, yeah. Indie, okay. the, when the boom happens, yeah. there's, there were a lot more indies that started. Okay, um, gotcha. There just weren't a lot. Back then, I mean, we were uh, ACW lasted, you know, maybe six months to a year after I left. Uh, I mean, there were other people. I think Ken Spence was running some around Winston Salem in that area. So uh, then there's the infamous, well, not infamous actually. There's the famous. Did you have something? Well, I was just gonna say, I, but the main reason I left was because. Mitch and, and Chaz were like, well, if they can go do jobs for Vince, why can't they do jobs for us? Okay. Well, this is our good talent. Yeah. This is people I know we can make money with. And so Matt came up with this idea. He said, I got an idea for a run match. He said, this Omega, the end of traditional mm-hmm. wrestling, the organization of modern stream grappling on mm-hmm. So he came up with this idea, posted it, and gave it to my parents' house. And the rest... Is history. And the rest is history. I mean, the rest is really As history. I mean, it's. Yeah, I look back on that, and it's like, and it was fifteen. Yeah, it was fifteen years ago this year. This was sure. '97, and it's like now, amazing. It's what you look back at what you know, just a group. Of, that's what passion can do for you. One of 
Matt's big things with Omega that helped the promotion was selling sponsorships, right? He was, from what I understand, he was pretty good. Yeah, uh, he was exceptionally good at that. He did. I, all I did was I showed up on show day. I got there early. I helped set up the ring. I helped. I, I owned the ring. I bought the ring. Uh, I, I bought paid Ted Allen, God rest his soul, fifteen hundred dollars. I got three thousand dollars out of. ACW, mm -hmm. but I got bought out. Okay. I had fifteen hundred dollars, which I had to sign a non compete clause. <laughs> sure. Exactly. Well, yeah. So anything that anybody said about Omega, Edie was the owner. Okay. Okay. And that's my sister, y'all. Yeah. Uh, so I, Edie was the owner. They're twins. <laughs> Don't tell her. Don't that. tell her. That. Yeah. So yeah, I told. So she. Uh, so she was actually on paper the owner, but I mean, it was me. I was there doing everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, she. He ran the door because I mean you you, I, you don't trust just anybody with your money. Right. Uh, so I it's so I, otherwise I mean so we had this ring that broke like the second show and everything. But it was you, there's just sometimes where you know magic. Yeah. From the first night, and so that was magic. My question though about sponsorships isn't to to expose or bring up what you did or what you didn't do. My question is. Sponsorship seems to be a really good way for promotions to bring in money that they don't have and to make payroll or make whatever. And it seems like Matt was very successful at that, and that really helped Omega. Yeah. But you don't see guys doing sponsorships now. And then. Well, and, and here's why. First off, if you what are sponsorships? You have to give for someone to give you money. You have to give something in return. So sponsorships would be an ad in our program or X number of tickets. ACW used to sell kids tickets and in the hopes that it would bring someone in, like a parent in with a purse. Mm -hmm. and didn't necessarily work with it, just dropped the little kids off mm -hmm. on the show. Matt always gave like tickets to the show for so if you buy a sponsorship, you get like a free ad and so many tickets. So basically, all he was doing was selling tickets. Okay. That's smart. Yeah. You're basically going out and selling tickets. I know one person who basically does sponsorships now. Besides, I mean, I think Ricky Nelson still does. And I mean, it's uh, phenomenally successful at it. But anytime that you connect with a local business, uh, with not so much uh, like a nonprofit group, sure. like a school or something, I mean, if you can't make money that way, you're. Don't need to be in business, mm -hmm. but I know Tyshawn basically makes folks has some of the guys sell go sell tickets, basically like sponsorships, okay. and you got the guys selling Frank tickets. Goodman, he does tickets though. Yeah, if you if you got guys, now, I know Viper to an extent does sponsorships with local businesses, and they get their post their name on the poster. Yeah, like, but I mean, I don't know to what extent that yeah, pays off. Exactly. I mean, if you, the only thing that makes money in wrestling. Like for a live show, it's selling tickets. Okay. And there's, that's it. So it has to be connected to, you're not going to get people, especially in this economy, yeah, to, yeah. to do anything. And even ACW, I mean, the economy was starting to get a little bit better. Uh, but it was still a hard sell. I mean, I, I might have people that, that I could get sponsors, say like, to, to buy, spend like $1,000 on sponsorships. Yeah. And and this is look when I ran Abby Phil and everything, but I mean it's the it's just takes somebody who has like the time and the legwork. And Matt was doing wrestling as his livelihood, mm -hmm. and so he kept all the sponsorship money. I I think it's, we we paid the show off the gate as far as I know. I mean, I, I'm sure this is something he and I eventually will sit down and sure. discuss. Yes, yeah. thing. But I, I think he did that. I mean, I always made sure I brought enough money. To cover the bills, of okay, my, and not the building. I, the building that was, it was his responsibility to take care of that, but like the talent, right? I made sure I always had enough money. Plus, there were some special people that I like that came a long way, like Joy Matthews and Christian York, that I always gave the extra money yeah. to. Yeah, so. and that's one thing that um, even people, even uh, past guests on the Safe House, has said about you. And I think that really anybody that's worked for you can't not say it about you. Uh, is that he, Thomas always gives you the money in you know 
out front right up. You don't have to wait till the end of the show. You don't have to wait around three hours for the promoter to make payroll. You don't have to wait to see if you did a good job. Yeah, I've had to go to, and I'll tell you why, because I've had to go to the ATM machine a few times after that, right. before. Well, Tom pays back, you before so. before you work, and and it's become sort of like your, your reputation. And now, do you, other than because you've had to go to the ATM and, and you know, this and that, like, do you think you do it now because it's sort of like a, promoters have such a bad stigma about oh, it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And plus, out of my, my self-respect. Sure, okay. I mean, I want people to, I mean, I don't care if wrestlers like me or not. Right. I, I, I pretty much, I, I think I've earned their respect mm -hmm. uh, just for uh, what I've done for people and, and what I have, I mean, uh, what I've helped people do. I don't, I don't see and that's a good segue. I don't, what? I don't see me having a, a me myself accomplished anything phenomenal, but I think there's some people that I have. That I, 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 I said that I know there are people Absolutely. that I have helped. I have a lot of people that have helped that I've helped them out and and, and have really changed wrestling and, and had a great impact on their careers. Yeah, and that's absolutely. and that's so. Then what do you say, nice. or, or how do you feel? You know, how do you feel or what do you say to those people who uh, are angry at you and say, F. Thomas, you know, he doesn't deserve respect. Was he ever? He's never, he's never taken a bump. He's oh, never had a five-star match. Oh, by, by, oh, well, I have taken bumps. Well, you know. I have not they, taken a five-star match. But you know how they say, what they say. I have not had a five-star match myself, but how many have I promoted over the years? It's true. How many have I booked over the years? I mean, not, and, and uh, I mean, they'll make a book. I mean, everybody knows that's mad. Mm -hmm. But... If there was no me, there was no Omega. Right. And he, all the boys were telling you that. Mm -hmm. So I mean, how many how many five star matches do I need to, uh, to promote, or even? Well, you've had some five star matches that I personally booked. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're myself, and I'm like, okay, we're gonna. I, I, I think David Richards match. And and, and some of them have even been in front of only like fifteen people, like say Milano Collection AT. And they didn't have to give you a five star performance, but they did. But they did. They respect you. Exactly. I mean, they were getting paid. Which is one of my favorite matches. Uh, mine too. Uh, <laughs> that, that's going on the the career retrospect DVD. And but it's I mean it's a matter of fact. So I don't care if people again they can say whatever they want to about me. Mm -hmm. I, it does not bother. It you know, used to, but mm -hmm. that's been at least a decade ago uh, since I actually cared. I, that's one less person that I have in the wrestling business. I have. That's one less crook yeah. that I have, or, or goofball that I have to fool with. I, oh, so let's please. So let's switch gears here for okay. a moment. Let's get <laughs> off of the, the, the career aspect of, of how you got into it and what you did. Uh, and, and I'm going to do that by say I'm going to segue into that by uh, briefly touching on how we met. Uh, for those because and actually, I think that's a good and, and that's a good thing because there was a period. The Hardys got signed in June of 98. Well, I think that's when that contract started. I knew in May of 98 they were going to work with me. Mm -hmm. We did two shows that summer. We did a... They started going on the road. We did... I did the fair. I ran the whole fair show myself at the Southern at the Moore County Agricultural Fair in 98. And they weren't there... Shane went on the road with them. The next year, the Dups were there. So, I mean, and we ran two more shows. One of the last one that, the last show we were all together was set, uh, was January of 99, the Hardys versus Sierra Thrillers match. Mm -hmm. that we were, and that's what, everybody was on the show. Okay. And um, C-Dub was also there that night. Uh, so we started, I mean, everybody was, and then by the end of that year, like, Matt, there was a guy uh, out in Wallace, North Carolina, who wanted to do a show. So, by that time, it was a mess. Uh, Jason had gone to work for Vince. Uh, Shannon and Shane were working for WCW. I guess this was 99. It was just, and then the next year, that, that year, the fair, the Ducks had gone to, they had started with ECW. And I mean, it was just like, and so it ended. So we did that one reunion show in December of 2000. 
which was something else. But uh, mm. which I mean it was it's it wasn't a very good show in a lot of ways. But I, I think there's some looking back on there's some kind of famous there were some famous things that that happened on that show. Mm. And uh, and then that was December two thousand. And then what happened in March two thousand one? ECW and WCW both went under. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was back where you were leading us. And do you, yeah, now do you remember the date of my first match? No, I you remember, remember the it the first was... time working for you, I think. Early, I remember the day you first worked for me, but I remember the, if it was the show, if it was the first show where I brought three count... To APW. Uh, I it was early May. May 5th, 2011. That's my it. first show. Now, juvenile delinquent. 2001. 2001, sorry, not 2011. I'm green as hell. 2001. I, I was a juvenile delinquent with Nick Fury, who is not my trainer and never trained me. I gotta throw that out there. Uh, but anyway. He uh, wasn't in that match, though, that night. Yeah, he was. It was me and Nick Fury versus uh, Power Crew. The, I must have been in the next week because it was. was Three count against Nick Fury and Brian Fury. Yeah, yeah, you were the eight. That was Shamrock. That was the eight, that was the Coliseum though. Yeah, that was Coliseum. Yeah. I my first match was uh, on the road, traveling show, like Marion or something. Okay, well then that yeah. was that was the next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was the next week. But uh, so me and Thomas meet by um, I was and I use this term as loosely as possible training at APW. Um, and, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I showed up. I gave Jay Eagle twenty bucks. He put some 80s music over on the loudspeaker, and then I was used as a crash test dummy for any APW superstar that would show up and want to try out their new moves. Weren't you one of the Hardy Boys? Yes, I was. I was. When, the, when, when, a, when Eagle was bringing the Hardy Boys out, that was, uh, I believe, me and was it TJ or Mark. I can't recall, but yeah, I was. But uh, so, um, sorry. So, training at APW, Thomas would show up every now and then. Thomas shows up. Because I was. Trying to do, I was doing some stuff with Nate Fury. I yeah. brought I brought three count in twice. Okay, yeah. And people are wondering what what went on with that. I guess I, we tell them that because what yeah, we'll happened. That. Let me finish okay. this first me, before I lose my tra my train of thought here. But uh, Thomas is a very loud Southern Bill. Thomas lets it, his it be known when he walks into a building. Uh, so you heard him uh, and John, 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 and Thomas also uh, gets off on. Uh, being witty and making comments towards people, as do I. It's just one of the things that we both like to do. Uh, and when you get two people who are very similar in that aspect together, it, it sometimes makes for an explosive thing. I was in the ring, I believe, with Nick Fury. Uh, and uh, I believe he was, we were working around, kind of grappling. He was trying to shoot on me, and Thomas was making all of these comments about how I was a skinny little stick, and this and that, this and that. You were a skinny little stick. And I was. And then I was drawing back with him about how he was a fat hippo, and... Uh, Thomas was like, I'll get in there and beat you up, this and that. And I was like, oh, you couldn't get in here because I couldn't lift two tons. And I was calling him a whale and all this. So we had a little verbal exchange. And uh, about right after that time, and I told you this, Nick Fury jerks me up by the collar. and he, he never trained me. I'm putting that out there. And he took me to the back and he goes, uh, do you know what you just did? He's got me up against the wall like we're about to embrace in a passionate kiss. Do you know what you just did? You just ruined your career. You just shot on and cussed at Thomas Simpson. Your career's done. You might as well quit wrestling. Now you're done. And I think it was a couple weeks later when me and you talked in the back and uh, we were cool. We talked in the end. And as a matter of fact, you were the. This was before we even had a relationship. You were the first guy to tell me, hey, maybe you should get rid of those Hot Topic pants and those ASIC shoes and buy some real gear and some boots. And it wasn't but, like, what, two weeks later, I had a pair of actual wrestling pants. Yeah, I, I don't know how. Really I don't know the time frame there, but I, don't know, I, I, I remember. I, I remember. I, I do remember talking to you, like. And actually, I took your split. advice on a lot of the things. The hardest thing for you to convince me to do was to shave my armpits. That took a while. And you look like a friggin' Ewok. <laughs> but I finally. But it was an Ewok. Yeah, I mean, it, it was bad. It was bad. The big of the Furby or something. But yeah. now, uh, now I think as as I and I, I'm glad you mentioned this because. Uh, uh, their, their periods where I, my memory has slipped. I remember talking to you and, and, and things were, were okay and with you and everything and I you know you were young and everything and then I it was summertime and I took some time off from APW and I didn't come back after the second three cap match. Well I, I did the three cap matches I came back and did a thing with Nick Fury. He broke your ribs. And he cracked my rib with his 
uh, 450. Because he was high. Yeah, for his 450 half splash stream, but people that ruined their careers pissed me off. I mean, that was one of them. Uh, but oh, I know how the tables turn. So, so I went, uh, so I, I left and I came back, and I think the next time I came back was like right after 9 11. And right after that, Hardy Boys magazine, magazine that was our came right out because you saw the magazine. And, yeah, and I said, wait a minute, I know you. And yes. I started marking on Thomas and I ran and I got the magazine from my car because at this point, other than the Shawn Michaels, who's like, you know, my father, uh, the Hardy Boys were the biggest influence. And, uh, you know, I was a huge mark for them. I mean, I would wear, you know, all the stuff that they wore in the ring out to the street on a daily basis <laughs> going to shop Hot Topic. But uh, I was, I was, I'm an artist and I was drawing, I drew this picture of Jeff Hardy and I wanted to show Thomas this picture of Jeff Hardy that I drew and I was like, I see you in the magazine and we started talking and uh, you were talking about how you were going to start running a show in Columbus? Yep. In Columbus. And uh, you did the post I was like, hey, I do graphic work and you're like, hey, well, if you do my poster, I'll get you a little spot on the show. And I was like, sure, why not? You know, you wanted something free out of me, I wanted a spot on the show. It worked. So I did the poster for it Got on the show. It was like some cruiserweight, um, like an eight-man match or something, some kind of crazy thing I'd come up with, like an elimination match. Now in Columbus, this building that Thomas was running at, it was an open arena building, but it had a balcony that went around it. What? How high? How high? I don't want to exaggerate it. At least fifteen to twenty. Feet. Fifteen twenty feet, and uh, I remember walking in this building, a young kid wanting to do everything, and the first thing I, I see this balcony, and my first thought is, what can I do off of this balcony? There's like eight other people in the match, so the, the possibility is limitless. So I go to Thomas, and I believe I asked you if you're okay, and you're like, hell, I don't care, do it. So uh, beginning of the match, big scramble, we're all on the outside, I run up to this balcony, I get right on top. I don't even think, nowadays I think, and <laughs> it ruins everything. I don't even think, I just jumped and front flipped right off. Boom. Yep. And of all things on that show, with all the talent that was on that show, by AJ Styles, mm -hmm. among other people, after I showed Matt Hardy the show, Matt Hardy was like, what about that kid that didn't dive off the balcony? So then is that, because I, I'm pretty sure at that point you weren't thinking, hey, maybe I can do something with this kid. Or maybe you might have been, but like when Matt says that and you realize, out of everything on that show, that's what he's remembering. Does that kind of make you say, maybe there's something, a diamond <laughs> Yeah, there, pretty much. Unfortunately. You know, <laughs> yeah. Damn you, Matt. Yeah, so, that so, was that was, so that was the start of you. Trying to do this uh, Omega 2.0 dream right around there. Mm. Um, that nightmare. Now that's about big night. You're talking about mistakes. Ask, big business wise. Well, you, you consider that to be your, your oh. biggest mistake out of, out of everybody you promoted, everybody you've know. tried to help. Is Omega 2.0 your biggest failure? That is my biggest failure financially. I mean, what okay. I mean, you, you put things in different perspective. Right. Like, here's a person, uh, talent wise. Who failed. Right. Here's a business failure. That was a business failure. Okay, well, let me That's a this. business failure. I'm giving you I'm giving you the capabilities to go back in your career and erase one thing from your professional wrestling career that's your biggest failure that you don't want to have to deal with anymore. What would it be? One thing that one I would thing. show it, but Whether I, it's a person, a relationship, a business, what? What? I'd have made you leave Shane Steele. <laughs> well, no, really. With his that, friends. Out of everything in your career, that that would would that really that caused me the because of of Stone that caused me yeah. the most trouble. Okay, in the sure. Run. So yeah, okay. I would I would do that. I mean, business wise, I mean, money exactly. money comes and goes. Mm -hmm. You you do something. The problem with that you sunk so much city money thing, in yeah, that, that far city. far city thing. That was a mistake. That was me listening to people other than myself. When I listen to people other than myself about yeah. wrestling, so if you unless it was like Matt Hardy. I mean, yeah, I, I, Matt Hardy's a little different. Yeah, if Matt says something, okay, I tell, I'm going to take this. I, this is something I should do. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but and even. But the, the time, so I, you know, I was listening to Jeff Hamrick mm -hmm. and the Future Shock, mm -hmm. which which Brandon Phoenix and yeah, I, you know, was friends now. It was different. Now. So if you could go back and and, well, and change something about that four C era to maybe, what what could you change to make it successful? I would have not rented a building. That's the and run every week. I would run once a week. Weekly month. shows, man. The weekly shows, even twice a, 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 a month, do not. 
I agree. And it I, is and it is based on the the premise it doesn't work unless you have guys pay for free. Okay. If you have guys work for free, mm-hmm. you can make it work in, in, in a way. And I just couldn't bring myself to do that. And see now when I and, and it's good, that's a very honorable trait. Now when I got involved back with Viper and I started working with Viper, uh, my thing was He's like, hey, man, what can we do to change HBW? And I was like, if you want my honest opinion, the first thing you need to do is stop running weekly. That's why your house is down. And that's why it's going to be down. And it always will be. Absolutely. Because people don't want to invest the time and stuff in like they used to. This is not a territorial thing. Right. And plus, Hendersonville is not a city the size of Greenville or Spartanburg or or Charlotte where they ran every week. Right. A little town, you're not going to draw consistently. People get tired of seeing the same guys. And it also breeds a lot of bad habits in people. Yeah. The wrestlers, the promoters, everything. It is, it's a, a source of laziness a point. and complacency. But looking back on that, Far City, what I, I would have just ran shows the thing that Jeff wanted somewhere besides Derek Driver's daddy's garage train. to train people. Mm-hmm. The garage is perfect. But he, exactly, and there was no reason to. You know, why do you feel like you have to get these to train people unless it's just to to help yourself with things? So I don't think, and I don't think it's training was very good either. And that's why I did not jump when the people were complaining I, about uh, you not being there for training, but you were going out and putting posters out for me, trying to make some money. I, I, okay, that and they and 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 that caused a lot of friction with people like the Future Shot guys. And then uh, another thing I made a mistake about, bringing in Jeff Lewis Neal, mm-hmm. Michael Adrian, Vinnie Payne, mm-hmm. the, Vinnie green, Payne. the oh. Greenville Jabroni. Let's call them the Wrecking Crew because they certainly <laughs> and made crew. their mess. Yeah. So, and speaking of those guys, and I think that this was their uh, their thought and their, their uh their idea. They shouldn't have any sauce because they're split. Right, right. <laughs> but I think th- I feel like this was their their idea. That, and, and I always thought like I I dislike this about Omega because that's not Omega. Let's call it. Okay, I dislike this about Forest City. Forest City. I just didn't feel it was right. That A and B locker room. You had your A locker room where you the, your superstars were, and then your B locker room. Well, they always worked with each other. Right. They worked with each other. They didn't work with y'all. I understand that. And that was a mistake too. Again, this was something. This was my. Well, that first was their idea, though, correct? The A and B locker room. That wasn't your idea, was it? I, I, uh, you don't know. That's ten years ago. Okay. I can't remember. Uh, I don't know. And there's, and there's a lot of that I've tried to put out of my mind. Yeah. Okay. I, understand. I think it may have been their idea, or I don't know what. I don't know what what it was. And again, this was my first time running like an actual a promotion besides my. You know, by myself, basically, because I, I wouldn't call Jeff having helped much. Now, now here's a funny story, real quick, before we. I, I feel we're about to dig into some uh, some some flames here. By, by that I mean heat. Uh, <laughs> between Forest, us and between me <laughs> and other people. Yeah, between you and other people. Ooh, Forest City. Yeah. Forest City uh, oh, was when uh, Youth Gone Wild. I was running with my partner Shane Steele. Youth Gone Wild. We were yeah. doing some some fun tag yeah. stuff. Uh, Mark uh, was a very lazy guy. Mark was um, a, a, a coattail rider, and um, Thomas tried to make you me got see a lot it. Of coattail I riders. didn't see it. Uh, me too. When it comes to friendship, I try to be really loyal, and uh, I liked. To be honest, I liked being the big fish in the little pond with the group. Like I was the leader of that little pack, and I liked having my little jabroni, Alex Stones, and Shane Steeles, and Jason Parker running around with me. It made me feel. It made me feel like I was the next Matt Hardy. You know, Matt was had the Omega crew. It made me feel like I was. Kind of try to recreating that history, uh, and so that was probably an ego thing on my part. But anyway, Shane Steele was very lazy, uh, very irresponsible. Shane Steele didn't wash his gear a lot of times, and Thomas would tell him, "You better wash your gear if you're working for me. If you do not wash your gear, you will not change in my building." And you told him that once. He came back the next week with gear that was so rancid it it would make someone a dead person hold their nose. And I remember Thomas was so pissed, he walked in that locker room, you grabbed Shane Steele's bag, and you took it outside and threw it in the parking lot, and you made this man change in the parking lot in front of the fans. You recall that? I did. That was great. 
was. <laughs> and you can still smell the gear in the in the building. <laughs> That's a funny story. It is, and, and but it's it's true. Okay, I mean I've got. Some oh, you should gear. always wash your gear. You should. You should always have oh, professional. So you should always wash your gear. I so mean, you should always present yourself as a professional. Sure. If you don't, why should you be paid? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. So. So you say that you should have never brought in the Greenville Wrecking Crew and your Jeff Lewis. I should not have. Michael no. and Adrian's. Yeah, one time, yeah, yeah, one time, remember when I started bringing AJ? Yeah. In? Yeah. And that's, AJ, AJ. And that's, yeah, and that's AJ Styles, y'all. Jeff. I call him Alan Jones. Yeah, okay, well, that's Alan. Yeah, so, but Jeff called me and hung, asking about why should I have to put over AJ? Jeff Lewis yes. asked you why Jeff Lewis. Yes. And then now this, and this is, now is now right AJ, before TNA. Yeah, this, this is right before TNA. On the cusp of breaking out. Right before TNA started. He just turned out his WWE contract. Yeah. And he's like, I'm like, because I told you so, jackass. That's it. That's it. Why are you, I, you dare to question me? I'm paying you. That's and I, you do what I tell you to do. That's it. And the story. You don't. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, you might be, I mean, I'm, if if it was somebody with more talent, could draw more money, I might or, or it was working for you know had a contract. Yeah, we we could fucking to negotiate some kind of thing. And now I remember at the time those guys were very uh, full of themselves and big on themselves. And in what's a sense, changed? Yeah, and in a sense, I also feel like they thought that they they had the pulse on you, like they were working you. But really, you knew that, and you ended up working them in the whole big swerve angle for the Cruiserweight division. Did you yes. remember that? Yeah, yeah, because uh, you got that was your first big win. Yeah, because career. I remember that Future Shock, especially Jamie. He he. They want Derek Driver. Yeah, and he would ensure everyone. Don't worry, I got Thomas under under my thumb, man. He, he'll do what I say. I'm working him. He's not working us. All person got to be under thumb might be Mom. Yeah, that's yeah. It. And then I remember, you know, obviously. <laughs> Guilty by association, Jeff Lewis and Michael would fall on the line. You know, they, they all thought they could tell you what to do, but right before you decided to close down Forest City, you ran this huge uh, cruiserweight tournament, and uh, you were like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll put Derek Driver over, and uh, you pulled a big swerve. Yeah, I'm not a big